Well, good morning, Westtown, and welcome back to another uh, episode of our adult Sunday school class. Um, I wanted to give a disclaimer. Uh, parents, this is not going to be a, a graphic Sunday school lesson in, in any way, shape, or form, but it is going to be a lesson on sex and sexuality, and I, I could see where some people might find this to be sensitive material uh, for children especially. So just a disclaimer, you may want to uh, watch this um, first before letting your children be around it or see it. Um, it's up to you, but just wanted to make that clear up front. So, so this is a, a lesson on sex, and I don't need to tell you that sex is everywhere. It's pervasive in our culture, uh, TV, uh, Netflix, <laughs> movies, music, advertising, you name it, it's saturated our culture. Um, sexual identity is a thing that we talk about now. We didn't used to talk about that, uh, but it's sexual identity is a way that people define themselves now. Um, sexual abuse, sex trafficking, porn addiction, all of these terrible things uh, are, are sad realities of the world we live in right now. Uh, they are they are at epidemic levels, uh, and the church, unfortunately, it suffers from this also. Uh, I, I read a recent study uh, that was done by Pew Research. It was a survey on sex, and it was a survey that that found that half half of people who identify as Christian believe that casual sex outside of marriage is always or sometimes acceptable. This is troubling because the Bible is very clear that uh, adultery, which is uh, when, when you're married and you have sex with someone who is not your spouse, and fornication, which is when is any kind of general sexual sin, so that would include sex outside of marriage, um, pre premarital sex, uh, homosexual sex, any, anything like that. Uh, it, is, it falls under the category of sexual immorality, and the Bible is clear that these are sins. So there are multiple places where we see that. One example would be 1 Corinthians 6, 18. Um, Jesus actually takes it even further than just talking about the, the physical act as sin. In Matthew 5, 27 and 28, he says that if anyone looks at a woman lustfully, he has committed adultery with her in his heart. And that would apply, obviously, for a woman looking at a man that way, too. So, if that's true, if that's what the Bible says, then why do we have half of identified Christians who believe that sexual sin is, is acceptable? Well, this is a huge issue. And this is not, not normally covered in apologetics. You, you likely won't find this in many classical apologetics books. I think you will start finding it more often, though, uh, in apologetics books because it's so pervasive in our culture and in the church. And we have to know how to talk about it. Um, and I think also the church has failed uh, miserably at addressing this issue. And so the church needs to be better equipped to talk about it. So, so let's dive into it. Um, now, I realize that this is such a huge issue that we could probably cover sexuality for the next eight to ten weeks and still not uh, have enough material on it. So just for today, I really only want to focus on one question. And that, cr that crucial question about sex and sexuality is this. Who is Lord over sex? That sounds it's a very strange question to ask, I realize. Uh, but, but really, just to flesh it out some more, um, do we as human beings have authority to set parameters around sex or, or to decide if there should be any parameters around sex. And I think, I think you would say that as human beings, we are more and more saying there, no, there should not be parameters around sex, or at least the individual gets to decide what parameters should be around sex for him or her. Um, so that's one side. Or, so, so is, is man, men and women, authority over sex? Or is God Lord over sex. We have to look at this, and the, the way we're going to start looking at it is, again, by going back to the Bible, where we find that, indeed, God is Lord over sex. It's very clear in Scripture. You know, you probably know passages 
that would speak to this. I mean, you have to look look at Exodus 20, the sixth commandment, thou shalt not commit adultery. Uh, Leviticus has numerous laws on different, different cases of sexual immorality. Uh, Jesus is teaching in Matthew 5, we already mentioned. He also talks about sex and marriage in Matthew 19, other places in the Gospels. Paul talks about sex in 1 Corinthians 6 and 7. He mentions it in, in Ephesians 5. So, but have you ever... Have you ever read or heard any of those teachings and wondered why? Why does God care? Why does God care who we sleep with? Why does God care what we do with our bodies? Why does God care what we do with sex? I think that's a fair question. And I don't know that you can answer that question just by looking at those verses that I just mentioned. I actually think you have to go back to creation to answer that question. And that's what we're going to do uh, today. And, and as a side note, I would say that the church, by, by not rooting this teaching back to creation, uh, the church often will end up presenting sex as something that is bad. Like, it's bad, don't do it except for when married people want to have kids. I know that probably you won't find churches who actually say it that way, but that's the impression that churches have often given off, which can sometimes lead to people saying, well, I, I don't want to be here. <laughs> I don't want to be at the church. I, I don't want to listen to that kind of teaching. Uh, so we need to root it back in creation. Uh, and we need to understand the Bible does present God as a God who delights in giving us good gifts. I mean, when we think about the gift of sex, all you got to do is go look at Song of Solomon. There's a whole book in the Bible about sex between a married couple, and, and it's a great book. You should read it. Uh, but let's, let's go to Genesis 1 and 2, uh, and what we see there is that God is the creator and designer of sex. Uh, Genesis 2, 24 and 25 says, Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother, and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. So the language there of two becoming one flesh is sexual language. It's pointing to the fact that God gives us sex as a gift. It's, it's yes, Genesis 1 says that one of its purposes is for humans to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. So it is for procreation, but it's also a gift for pleasure. God delights in giving us these gifts that are for our enjoyment. We see this uh, alluded to in Genesis 2.23. So uh, God creates Eve, the woman, and, and when Adam first sees her, he says, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. Now you may not get this from the English reading of the text, but this is poetry. In fact, you might even argue this is a song. When Adam sees Eve and sees how beautiful and wonderful she is and sees that he is that she is like him, but distinct from him, and that God made her for him, what does he do? He breaks out into song. He's like, oh, and, and it's, it's just wonderful. So the point here is that Adam and Eve being together is not just for procreation. It's for the enjoyment of the relationship, for the enjoyment of being together and sex is part of that enjoyment but the next thing we need to see is that god does give the gift of sex as a celebration of the gift of marriage the two cannot be separated uh genesis 2 18 so so follow here follow my logic here uh genesis 2 18 says then the lord god said it is not good that the man should be alone i will make him a helper fit for him who is that helper it's it's eve uh, Derek Kidner says that uh, Eve is a help opposite Adam, corresponding to Adam. You could actually translate the, the Hebrew that way. Uh, so Eve is created in God's, God's image just like Adam. She is equal to Adam in dignity. She's equal to Adam in purpose. Uh, they are both equally lovingly created in God's image. Uh, but she, Eve, is not a carbon copy of Adam. She is human but she is a distinct, di distinctly different human than Adam is. She is, in fact, a complement to him. So God purposefully 
lovingly created Adam as a man and purposefully lovingly created Eve as a woman on purpose. This is not a mistake. And, and though there, are, there is much confusion about gender and, and sex today, I think we all need to understand that however we are created biologically is how God intended it for us to be created. That is his decision. It is not ours. So marriage, marriage as God created it, what we need to see is that it depends on this complementary relationship, the complementary nature of male and female coming together. Uh, verse 24, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife and they shall become one flesh. So again, leave and cleave, leave, leaving the the authority of father and mother and then going out and establishing a new family uh, and then two becoming one flesh. This is marriage covenant language. Now, now you might think, wait, you just said that this is sexual language. And I said, and I, I would agree, I did say that, but it's both. It's both. God gave us the gift of sex as a celebration of the union of marriage between one man and one woman. Uh, it's a celebration of the covenant that exists when these two people come together and are joined together as one flesh. So in marriage ceremonies, we traditionally, at least in the West, we exchange rings. And the ring, the ring is designed as a circle to represent the unbreakable forever union that's taking place there. Uh, the Bible, I believe, the Bible wants us to think of sex in a similar way to a ring. Uh, what do I mean by that? Well, I, what I mean is that sex is a physical act designed by God to represent this one flesh union. So it, I use that word carefully, represent, think of it as represent um, the covenant union that, is exi that exists between a man and a woman. That, that covenant union did not exist before the two got married, but then they get married and now it does exist and sex is designed to be a way, you, go, you could almost say that it's designed to be a way that the man and the woman continually act out their covenant union together. So this is why, this is why this creation ordinance of sex, of marriage and sex within marriage, this is the way God created the world to be. And this is why God says that sex Outside that context, whether we're talking about uh, adultery or, or just sexual immorality in general, that's why God says that is sin. Okay, we, we need to see this, that it's rooted in creation. In fact, that's exactly what the New Testament authors do. That's what Jesus does. Jesus roots this in creation. Okay, we're going to read that verse in a second. Paul roots this in creation in both Ephesians 5.31 and in 1 Corinthians uh, 6. Jesus in Matthew 19, 4 through 6, actually um, reiterates this creation ordinance. He says, Haven't you read that at the beginning the Creator made them male and female and said, For this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Jesus reiterates this creation ordinance. This is what Jesus believed about marriage and about sex. Because Jesus is the one who created it. So the fact that God would, would put these parameters around sex is not because he's some cosmic killjoy who does not want us to have pleasure. It's actually because he wants us to get the most possible pleasure out of sex. Because he wants to show us what it is designed for, how it is to be done rightly. So the last thing I want to say about this is, is just to address briefly uh, the church's record of confronting sexual sin. Because I think this is a huge hang up for people. There have been a lot of people throughout history who have just been um, hurt ex extremely badly, damaged by the church's handling of this. Um, and the church, if I, if I were, if I've ever hurt anyone as a pastor, 
uh, in the way that I've addressed this, and I am deeply sorry. Um, and, I, and I know most churches probably mean well, but you know, some churches have simply conformed to the culture on this issue. Think back to the survey that we just that I talked about at the beginning that says that half of those who identify as Christian find casual sex outside of marriage to be usually okay. Uh, that's a failure of the church, I believe. But others, other churches have treated sex as though it's it's the worst sin possible, like it's on a like a hierarchy of sins, and it's the top one. And if you do that one, then then, then there's like no forgiveness for you or something like that. It's the way it seems, at least. And yes, sexual sin can often have worse consequences than others. Um, but in God's eyes, sexual sin is no different than gossip. In fact, I've I've heard someone say uh, that gossip is pornography of the mouth. Uh, sexual sin is no different than, than gluttony in God's eyes. So what we need to understand is that though this sin may have greater earthly consequences sometimes, it's, it's not an unforgivable sin. Uh, Jesus' teaching, in, in fact, is that a sexual sinner can find forgiveness just as easy as someone who, who just tells a white lie. Jesus can and does and will forgive anyone who has fallen in this area. And and we need to understand, too, Jesus' teaching in Matthew 5 uh, basically says that we are all guilty of this. I mean, who has not looked lustfully at another person? We all do that. So we are all guilty of sexual sin because Jesus is saying it begins in our hearts. And so we all need to seek forgiveness for this. And then we also need to remember, okay, look at the Bible again. Look who has committed sexual sin in the Bible, okay? Abraham, Jacob, Judah, Tamar, Rahab, Samson, David, Bathsheba, Mary Magdalene. You you get the idea. We could keep going. That's not to say that it justifies sexual sin. That's to say that uh, there there are sexual sinners throughout the scriptures that God uses as part of his story of redemption. And God can do that for any of us too. Uh, the key is for us to, to go to Jesus and find forgiveness in him. And, and just as we close, what, what should be the church's posture then towards sexual sinners? Well, no, we, we, we should absolutely uh, welcome a sexual sinner with open arms. Should we affirm their sin? Absolutely not. Uh, but of not affirming their sin doesn't mean that we are not affirming the person. Okay, we, we can separate those two out. Um, your, your identity is not your sin. Your sin is not your identity. Uh, the church's posture then should be to care for, to shepherd, to help, to come alongside, to pray for, uh, to meet with, to love on a sexual sinner or, or any type of sinner. Because look, that's all of us. We're all sinners, and we all need to come to Jesus and find that his forgiveness and his salvation are an even greater gift than than the gift of sex. Thank you for joining us today. It's a tough topic. Uh, Next week, uh, we'll be back with another one. So uh, thank you, and have a great week.